Good morning. It is my privilege and main function in this meeting as president-elect to introduce the 75th president of the Society of Surgical Oncology prior to his presidential address. Jim Howe is a tremendously accomplished surgeon scientist whose busy clinical practice focuses on endocrine surgery. With a remarkable training pedigree, Jim over his 27 years has risen to the rank of full professor. He runs an NIH-funded genetics-focused research lab, has over 150 peer-reviewed manuscripts and 49 book chapters. In addition to being the president of the Society of Surgical Oncology, he is also president of the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society and a member of the Society of Clinical Surgery. But what do we really know about the quiet reserve man from Iowa? Well, for starters, he's not from the Midwest. Jim was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama in December of 1960. In addition, I did not know that Jim's formal name is James Robinson Howe V. The original James Robinson Howe, Jim's great-great-grandfather, is shown on the left in a picture from the 1890s. In the right, you see Jim with James Robinson Howe's four and six, his son and father. Jim's dad was an English professor and his mother a psychologist. When he was young, he moved from Alabama to Vermont, where he started out on the straight and narrow, shown here with his family, saluting his parents after completing his chores and decorating the family Christmas tree. But as Jim got into high school, he became a little more of a carefree teenager, as you can see by his hair getting longer and his picking up how to play the guitar. From high school, Jim went to Dartmouth College and was in a fraternity called Tabert. Most fraternity group pictures usually have members displaying some symbolism in their gestures, but I must admit, even being from Dartmouth myself, I was at a loss to figure out the meaning of Jim shown in the circle, making a fist with one hand and holding a cat in the other. Jim enjoyed Dartmouth life as shown on the right, having a few beers with his college roommates. And in this iconic picture, serenading several women with his guitar on the steps of his fraternity, just moments before one of his frat brothers put an abrupt end to his guitar playing days. From Dartmouth, Jim went to UVM Medical School, where he got more serious about his studies, played a lot of soccer, and eventually graduated in 1986. He then started his surgical residency at Washington University under Chairman Sam Wells. Dr. Wells, a past Society of Surgical Oncology president, had a strong influence on Jim's clinical focus of endocrine surgery and his research focus in genetics. It was at Washington University that Jim met his wife, Denise, shown here on the left at their wedding in 1989. Denise helped Jim regain his confidence to re-explore his musical talent shown here signing or singing at their wedding. But note, he does not have a guitar. Jim then went to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center where he trained under Murray Brennan and started his family shown here on the left with his son, James VI. The picture of fellows around Jim during his time at Memorial Sloan Kettering on the right is notable for the presence of four future SSO presidents, Dr. Brennan, Coit, Bartlett, and Jim himself. In 1996, Jim began his academic career at Iowa and has remained there to this day. Early after starting, Jim and Denise welcomed their daughter, Julia, to the family. Jim worked closely with Dr. Ron Weigel, his department chair, another SSO past president, to become the internationally recognized surgeon, scientist, mentor, and Hawkeye fan that many of you have come to know. But what you may not know is that in spite of all his professional success, Jim struggled to find his true non-medical passion. He tried mountain climbing, but summiting the highest peaks did not seem to bring joy to his face. He then explored high-speed water sports, but emotions of sheer panic seemed to dominate his adventures. He then tried reverting back to his Dartmouth days and joined a father-son team beer pong league, shown here with his son James VI, who I think is actually laughing at his dad because after 40 years, Jim has forgotten how to hold a beer pong paddle. Jim then auditioned for Dancing with the Stars with his daughter, Julia, but this too was short-lived as Jim couldn't bring himself to wear the dance outfits that the producers wanted. Jim even went as far as trying to replace Steve Irwin on The Crocodile Hunter, but just couldn't quite live up to the name. 
Finally, Jim listened to the voices of another fellow Iolian who said, if you build it, they will come. However, since it was winter at the time that he heard these voices, he opted to build a hockey rink instead of a baseball field. While initially only a few people showed up, Jim persisted and utilized a few tricks from his Dartmouth days, note the Scotch whiskey and Knob Creek bourbon, and suddenly many people came and Jim found his true passion, which over time has evolved to joining a men's hockey league team and hitting the pinnacle of winning the elusive Stanley Keg. I hope I have provided you with a little more insight into the man from Iowa and his close-knit family. It is my honor to present to you James Robson Howe V, our SSO president, who deserves tremendous credit for steering the organization through an exceptionally challenging year. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Doug. 2020 has been a very eventful year, so I thought I would walk through how the Society of Surgical Oncology has navigated through the pandemic and what we've learned. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. It's been a great honor to serve as your president over the past year. It's something that I could not have imagined as I attended my first meeting in 1996 and in all the meetings in between. First, I wanna give thanks to the people who have made all this possible. I could not have done this without the love and support of my wife, Denise, who has made so many sacrifices over the years so that I could do these things. I also thank my children, James and Julia, who remind us why we do what we do. I also want to thank Dr. Carol Scott Connor, who hired me at the University of Iowa and later made a division chief out of me. Ron Weigel, who followed her as chair, who has been very supportive to all my academic supports and has become a very good friend. And then to all of the staff members in the, society, in the uh, Division of Surgical Oncology at the University of Iowa, who do such important work for our patients. I was very grateful to have matched at Barnes Hospital and worked under the mentorship of Sam Wells, both in the clinics and the laboratory. He has really pushed me to be the best I can be throughout my career. I also worked in the lab of Helen Donis Keller and was exposed to great surgeons like Jeff Moley, Jeff Norton, Jesse Turnberg, Bill Craybill, Marvin Lopez, Greg Sakar, Charlie Roper, Bill Monifo, and Wayne Fly, amongst many others. I also was lucky enough to attend Memorial Sloan Kettering, where I got to work under Murray Brennan, who so many people have given praises of uh, previously. He was a great mentor, as were so many others like Al Cohen and Dan Coit and Jayton Shaw and Les Bloomgart and everybody else on this slide and many others who aren't on the slide. All these experiences have helped me to shape who I am today. So this talk is gonna be about the pandemic and specifically how it has affected what we do as an organization. Just to step back and look at where we are right now is sobering. COVID-19 has killed more Americans than have died in World War II and ranks third in deaths behind the Civil War and the Spanish flu of 1918. We all know people who have died from this disease and now we're getting a little bit complacent about it. And it, Perhaps this quote from Albert Camus will bring us back to the sobering reality. In his book, The Plague, he said, admittedly, the number of dead from one day to the next was not rising, but it seemed that the plague had settled comfortably into the, its peak and was carrying out its daily murders with the precision and regularity of a good civil servant. Well, let's go back to where we were in January of 2020. At this point with the SSO, we were very excited because the, uh, the meeting was coming up in March. The, we were gonna call this the International Conference on Surgical Cancer Care. It was gonna happen between March 25th and March 28th in 2020. And the most exciting thing that uh, we had kind of led up to was something called the hub. The Reimagination Task Force had met for the last year and a half to think of new ways to bring learning opportunities to our members. And the hub was an integrated experience zone, which was going to replace the normal exhibit hall. And this would still have places for vendors, but would also have areas for networking and conversation and for socializing, celebrating, and actually relaxation and recharging. 
there were going to be five different disease zones, which looked something like this, where one half of the disease zone would be areas for the vendors, and the other half would be areas where people could congregate and get together and network and, and just sit and relax. Over the exhibit hall, there were going to be five of these centers shown here. These represent different disease site groups, and there was going to be an exhibit theater right here. Now, we were going to have 105 hours of content, and 56 hours of that content was to be delivered in the hub. So we were very excited about this new paradigm for our meeting. We thought it would really enhance things. But at about the same time, right before the meeting, things started to happen in the world. In January, the WHO announced a pneumonia case in Wuhan. And the first case of such a pneumonia on January 21st in the state of Washington. The WHO issued a global health emergency on January 31st. And then on February 2nd, they issued a travel ban from China. We declared a public health emergency the following day. And then the WHO named the virus SARS-CoV-2 and the disease COVID-19. Now, what was happening at the SSO right about the time that we were hearing about these cases was that we were getting pretty excited. The meeting was generating some buzz. We had a record number of registrants of 1,486. We had just finished the Advanced Cancer Therapies meeting from February 15 to 17, where we had a record attendance. And now this virus stuff was happening around the world. And the question was, how is this going to affect our annual meeting? We started discussing this at our weekly uh, mid-February leadership meetings, and that was attended by Dave Bartlett, myself, and Eileen Widmer, the CEO. We started deciding to start to analyze the contracts and the costs that it might uh, be incurred if we were to have to postpone or cancel our meeting if the virus got worse. We looked at our contracts, and we found that they were still in force because there was no state or federal government action going on. And the force majeure clauses did not cover COVID-19 or infectious diseases. So we were looking at about a $700,000 to $1.4 million cost for canceling the meeting. But instead of canceling, we explored the possibility of postponement. And because of the good relationship of the SSO with the hotels and the convention center, we were able to negotiate for a postponement to, say, August, which was the only week available, to have our in-person meeting. Now, this postponement was then approved by the executive committee on the 5th of March, which is only three weeks before the meeting, and by the executive council the following day. We then let the membership know of the postponement on this, uh, the same day. Now, meanwhile, COVID-19 was starting to uh, become more and more in the news. In early March, Italy locked down. The New York Stock Exchange ceased trading after it dropped 7% that day. On the 11th, the WHO declared a worldwide pandemic, and the stock market decreased by 30% in one day. U.S. cases exceeded 1,000 the following day. And then on the 13th, Trump declared a national emergency and a European travel ban. The Senate passed the CARES Act about two weeks later, and then by... March 28th, New York City had registered 31,000 cases. The FDA then authorized the use of hydroxychloroquine at the end of that month. Now, the federal government did not really take the lead in issuing stay-at-home orders or shutdowns. So instead, the states began doing their own. California started on March 19th, followed by Illinois and New Jersey on the 21st, and New York on the 22nd, and then Massachusetts on the 24th. And again, our meeting was supposed to take place between the 25th and the 28th. By April 7th, 43 states had issued stay-at-home orders, while seven states, including my own home state of Iowa, never issued these orders. Meanwhile, if we look at COVID-19, moving forward in April, on the 2nd, the CMS introduced preventative measures for long-term care centers. On the 24th, the AACR went to a virtual meeting. On the 28th, U.S. cases exceeded 1 million. On the 1st of May, the FDA granted emergency use of remdesivir. 
And then on the 15th of May, the CMS and White House introduced gating criteria to reopen the economy. On the 28th, U.S. deaths passed 100,000. And then on the 29th, ASCO had their meeting virtually. Now, surgery at many different places around the country was essentially shut down or significantly reduced during this time period. New York City was inundated with cases, Chicago, Detroit, New Orleans, all sorts of places were under emergency conditions. Things in Iowa weren't that bad, but on 3-16-20, we were asked to reschedule all our elective cases. And then a few days later, we were told we could only do essential surgeries, and we had to cut down to 75%, by 75%, the number of cases. Now, essential cases were defined as those where a delay in surgery would lead to compromised patient outcome. On 4-27-20, we were allowed to resume elective surgeries as the hospital realized that we didn't get inundated as much as we thought, and we were able to catch up with PPE. But we had to introduce many different uh, in, uh, practices. We had to do COVID testing before surgery. We had to try to preserve PPE wherever we could. There was a no visitor policy, and we had to screen all employees and all patients as they entered the building. Now, the SSO responded to these events on 423 to vote to explore the changing from an in-person meeting in August, where we postponed it to, to a virtual meeting. And about it, Two weeks later, as we did explore things, we decided to cancel the in-person meeting because it was clear that the cases were increasing and that there's probably no way we could do this. The executive council approved this a few days later, and then we decided to make the virtual meeting at no cost to our members. We sent emails to the registrants and different refund options uh, a few days later. And we did not have any contract penalties because now travel bans and limits on gathering were in place and we could get out of the contracts without penalty. So what were the challenges to pivoting to a virtual meeting? First of all, in 2019, we had 71 hours of content over two and a half days. We were gonna have in 2020, 105 hours of content, as I mentioned, but what we, should we do for a virtual meeting? We knew that our members were getting tired of being on Zoom meetings over the last several months. And we also knew that as OR schedules started opening up again, that pac patients and surgeons needed to catch up on their cases. So we decided for this virtual meeting that we would focus on certain items. And that was the named lectures, the oral presentations, and the poster presentations. This will allow for the research that the fellows and residents have worked so hard on to give them the opportunity to present. But we did have to cut out a, a fair amount of the content. If we look at the schedule of the meeting in 2020 in August, it happened on Monday and Tuesday nights. On the first night, it was only two hours and three quarters, and it had the name lectures and six parallel sessions for oral abstract presentations. And on the second day, it was two hours and 20 minutes, and again, had name lectures and oral presentations. It had 20.3 hours of content, and there were 140 oral presentations and 379 posters that were presented. Now, with respect to the meeting, there were 1030 people that signed on, and they came from 43 countries. And the first day, there were 760 people, and the second day, there were 557. If we look at the attendance of different sessions from 2020, shown here in red versus the blue in 2019, we see that a few sessions, HPV, melanoma, upper GI, HPV2, and quality2 all had higher attendance than the 2019 meeting, but that the presidential address, the Ewing lecture, and the John Wayne lecture had lower attendance, but the, AC, the ACS uh, basic science lecture actually had higher attendance. If we look at the meeting, in retrospect, there were several pros of it. First of it, it was short and easy for people to attend. They didn't have to take a lot of time out of their schedule to go those two nights. We were allowed to have the residents and fellows present all the oral presentations and all the posters. And we generally got pretty good ratings in our post-meeting survey. Now, the cons of this meeting were that there were a few glitches, not too many, but there were a few. 
it had limited content. So we didn't have any of the symposia that we would normally have. We didn't have the great debates and we didn't have meet the professor sessions. The sessions were a little bit inconsistent when it came to the questions and answer parts of the oral presentations. And there were really no opportunities for networking. So these are things that we really looked at and tried to improve this year's meeting. Now, another issue uh, came up is going back to the COVID timeline. The US cases were reaching 2 million by June. They surpassed 3 million by July and uh, 4 million by the end of July. Right before our meeting, we're up to 5 million. Then there is our meeting, and then we reach 6 million by the 31st of August, right after the meeting. And then the U.S. death toll passed 200,000 on September 22nd. So that's kind of where we were at the time of the virtual meeting. Cases were continuing to increase in the United States. Now, another technical issue that we had to deal with was the fact that our annual business meeting usually needs to occur the last day of the meeting, but it also has to occur within 13 months of the last business meeting. So since the one before that was in March, we had to schedule this on April 16th. And we're happy to say that we actually had increased attendance at the business meeting with 170 people instead of say 60 to 75 in the previous years before that. And I must say that we were able to successfully complete an orderly transition without controversy from David Bartlett to myself. Now, during this time where we knew we couldn't meet in person and we knew we were going to have a virtual meeting, we really wanted to get busy and do some things to help the membership. And we really put a lot of effort into SSO publications and web resources during the pandemic. And this was helped by the foresight that we had had earlier to go with a new platform called Expert Ed, which was launched on April 6th, just in the nick of time. Now, right around this time, the American College of Surgeons had released general triage guidelines on 32420, which basically broke down acute cases in, into phases of care, depending on how inundated your center was with COVID-19 cases. So what we wanted to do was to develop tri triage guidelines for cancer cases. We assumed that COVID-19 cases would significantly increase and that there would be shortages of PPE, staff, ventilators, ICU beds, and ORs. And we wanted to decide which cancer patients needed surgery versus, uh, now versus those who could wait. And to do this, we got together the disease site work groups with the chairs and the vice chairs. And of these eight disease site work groups, we asked them to try to prioritize cases, assuming there might be a three to six month delay. And they came up with uh, different disease specific content. And here's an example of the colorectal guidelines, which suggests that if you have early cancers, say cancers and polyps, that those cases should be deferred. But if a patient was obstructed, had perforated, or was actively bleeding, then those cases really did need to get done. In cases where neoadjuvant therapy was an option, they should go ahead and get neoadjuvant. Or if they just completed neoadjuvant, you could probably wait a little bit longer to perform the surgery. Another thing that happened about a month after that, as mentioned earlier, was that the uh, CMS and the White House came up with gating criteria for opening up the economy again, and that applied also to opening up elective surgeries. And they were concerned with the fact that the economy was having trouble, and they thought that if it could be opened up, uh, that you know, if certain criteria could be fulfilled, that maybe we could go forward. And their criteria were like a downward trajectory of influ influenza-like illness or COVID-19 cases over 14 days. And then hospitals that are treating patients without crisis care and that those that have robust testing programs in place would be eligible to resume elective surgeries. So we wrote a paper where we tried to synthesize both the CMS and the White House gating criteria to give guidance to our members. Now, we did many other web-based resources on COVID-19. Um, here are just a, a list of a few things. We had 69 new educational programs. 21 of these were virtual tumor boards. These weren't all on COVID-19. These A lot of these were just related to disease sites, but they did provide educational content for our members, and nearly 1,700 people signed on for those. 
We also had 25 Surge Onk podcasts, which were accessed over 4,000 times, some on COVID, some on hot zone interviews. And then also very important was the Annals of Surgical Oncology, which this past year set a new record with 1,001 manuscripts. So of the publications that we wrote, we mentioned two of them earlier. There were another five that came out in the next few months uh, by members of the Society of Surgical Oncology, which uh, uh, illuminated various issues related to COVID-19. And we made direct links of these available to our members. We also had a variety of resources uh, from different societies like the American College of Surgeons, uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and the FDA, Lancet Oncology. We made direct links to our members to these various really important and valuable resources to help people get through the pandemic and to know what to do in certain situations. We also had a variety of podcasts. We made podcasts from those different triage guidelines. We did one for for each uh, of those disease sites. We did COVID-19 related webinars. We actually interviewed the, what we call the hot zones, Chicago and Boston, New Orleans and Detroit, New York and San Francisco, uh, to see what their experiences were so that other people can learn from what these people have been through. We also had two sessions where we interviewed fellows and young attendings to see what their experience was with COVID-19. We put online links to COVID-19 registries, and we described them. So our members, should they want to accrue patients to these registries, could easily uh, enter this information. <clears throat> now, as all this was going on, we really started to think about what was going to happen in March 2021. We were supposed to have an in-person meeting on March 18th and 19th, but it became clear with the events that were going on that maybe this wouldn't happen either. So again, if we look back at what was happening with COVID around the time of our last meeting, it became the third leading cause of death in the United States behind heart disease and cancer. On 9-28, worldwide deaths exceeded 1 million people. President Trump got it on October 2nd. On October 8th, there was a spike in cases throughout the nation. And on 11-4, there were 100,000 cases in one day. But a glimmer of hope came on the 16th and the 18th when the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines were reported to have significant efficacy, and we thought that maybe there is a way out here. By January 1st, we reached 20 million cases in the United States, and by January 19th, we surpassed 400,000 deaths, and it was now the leading cause of death in the United States. So our response to these events, which were occurring during this year, was initially in June, we started thinking that we better cancel the in-person meeting. It really didn't look like it was going to be able to happen in March. And we found out with the hotel and the convention center that we could have no charges if we rebooked for the years 24 and 25. And at that time, we voted to explore all different options for the 2021 meeting, which might include uh, postponing the meeting and having an in-person meeting in August, going to a virtual meeting in August, or just staying with a virtual meeting in March. We looked at venues for August 2021, and they're very limited. So that didn't look like a good option. And then we discussed all these options with the Executive Council on August 13th. About a month later, the executive committee voted to move to a virtual meeting at our usual time in March of 2021. The scientific program committee and the reimagination task force now needed to get to work because instead of the usual 12 months to prepare for the meeting, we only had six months now. After extensive discussions, we decided that the meeting should again be over two days, but now we were going to offer more content, and this was going to be about eight hours per day. And we were going to make sure to present all the oral presentations and the posters, which represent the research of the SSO. All this, uh, there'd be one symposia for each disease site. There'd be two special interest symposia, and we would bring back four debates. And again, the debates in the symposia are the wisdom of the SSO. And finally, we would try to work hard to make meet the professor sessions, networking, and have a contest to increase the interest in the meeting. Now, I've got to say that none of this would have been possible this whole last year without the work of the SSO staff. 
And Eileen Widmer, the CEO, needs to be given great credit for the skill with which she and the senior leadership, which included Karen Hurley, Patty Stella, Karen Araujo, and Jeanette Ruby, brought forward to keep all these things on track. It was extremely complex, and we had to do a lot of moving around and uh, making you know decisions in a short time frame. Now, this also wouldn't have been possible without the executive committee with Doug Tyler as president-elect, Sandra Wong as the vice president, Kelly Hunt as secretary, Rhonda Mateo as treasurer, and Dave Bartlett as past president. We were able to meet frequently and on short notice to make important decisions. And then the executive council was a check on us to make sure that our thought process was correct because they represented a wider group of the membership and their input was incredibly helpful as well for moving forward. Again, we have to thank the Scientific Program Committee under the leadership of Marty Heslin for being able to change from an in-person to a uh, virtual meeting. The Reimagination Task Force worked hard to come up with new ideas of things to put forward at this meeting, and we couldn't have done that without the help of Becky Williams from the SSO. So moving forward from here, we learned a few things. First of all, the finances in 2020 looked like we were going to take a significant hit at the beginning of the year when we had to cancel the meeting, postpone it, and then go virtual. We also had a problem with the fact that the staff weren't allowed to come to the SSO offices and had to work remotely. Fortunately, we applied for a Paycheck Protection Program loan. We were granted it. And we had a couple openings that we did not hire in order to conserve further resources. And our investments did very well. So we were able to end the year with a net positive balance. So what did we learn? We learned that the SSO is extremely sound organizationally and financially, that the SSO leadership and staff responded to changing and unpredictable conditions, and that virtual meetings and online education are not going away. In-person meetings will likely return when the population has largely been vaccinated, and we all look forward to a return to a new normal soon. So I'm going to end here by thanking you for the privilege of serving as your president for the last year. Here's looking forward to next year when we can get together with our residents, our mentors, and our friends to discuss how we showed up for work every day and just kept taking care of cancer patients and continue to advance the science and practice of surgical oncology. It will be so great to see you all again. Thank you.